News feed now. Coronavirus facts, not fear, begins now. Good Tuesday morning. Welcome into News Feed Now. I am Aaron Nola. We're going to jump right into the numbers for COVID-19. It is the topic that we're focusing on here on News Feed Now for the last several weeks and into the future. In the U.S., there are over 1.3 million cases. The death toll is now at over 80,000. And if you watch our show regularly, you can tell the, the map has changed. And the reason is because we're going to start kind of showing you some different states and where they are. Yesterday, some of the states like Arkansas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, were in the same shade as New York. And obviously, New York is having a lot more cases than those in the South and Midwest. So now the numbers are a little bit different. But New York still is the epicenter, 340,000. California with almost 70,000. Again, almost 81,000 deaths. The nation's top health officials testifying right now in front of Congress for the first time since the coronavirus pandemic began. You saw Anthony Fauci. He is there right now in Washington talking. The nation's top infectious disease expert is warning Congress that if the country reopens too soon during the coronavirus pandemic, it will result in needless suffering and death. Fauci, among the health experts testifying today, his testimony comes as President Trump is praising states that are reopening after the prolonged lockdown aimed at controlling the virus. Here's some of what Fauci said. As I've said many times publicly, what we have worked out is a guideline framework of how to safely uh, open America again. And there are several checkpoints in that, with a gateway first of showing, depending on the dynamics of an outbreak in a particular region, state, city, or area, that would really determine the speed and the pace with which one does re-enter or reopen. So my, my word has been, and I've been very consistent in this, that I get concerned if you have a situation where the dynamics of an outbreak in an area are such that you are not seeing that gradual over 14 day decrease that would allow you to go to phase one. And then if you pass the checkpoints of phase one, go to phase two and phase three. What I've expressed then and again is my concern that if some areas, cities, states, or what have you, jump over those various checkpoints and prematurely open up without having the capability of being able to respond effectively and efficiently, my concern is that we will start to see little spikes that might turn into outbreaks. So therefore I have been being very clear in my message to try to the best extent possible to go by the guidelines which have been very well thought out and very well delineated. Let's go live now to Washington, D.C. Trevor Shirley joins us. Trevor, first things first, I, I tried to watch some of this, uh, and it was a lot of uh, medical jargon, a lot of political jargon. But for the American people, what's the significance of this hearing? Why is the Senate holding this hearing today? Well, essentially, the, the Senate is holding it for two fronts. One, to get an update on the overall response uh, of the U.S. government to this pandemic. Also, just to get an update in terms of where testing stands, where vaccine development stands, and then also to get a better sense of where we're headed over the next three to six months. One thing that they've really focused on this morning, at least initially, with Dr. Fauci was talking about what it's going to look like this fall when we start to see schools and universities heading back into session and opening up. And Dr. Fauci was pretty stark in his assessment. He said, you know, it's, it's way too optimistic to think that we're going to have uh, some kind of prophylactic treatment or a vaccine ready to go by the time uh, the students start going back to school. He said uh, in terms of testing, I think it was uh, Dr. Redfield or perhaps uh, Dr. Jawa that addressed the testing issue. They said there is the possibility or the likelihood that we're going to see the ability to test widely, especially at universities. Uh, but that's, again, not a treatment. That's a diagnosis that could give people a better sense of, of who has it, who's been exposed, and who is still potentially vulnerable to it. Uh, but they were very stark in their assessment that it's going to look different uh, when we head back to school, especially this fall. Trevor, the thought process on this from some waiting for this hearing was that Dr. Fauci was finally going to be able to say whatever he needed to say 
without the president hanging over him. Was that, in fact, the case, as some have reported, you know, I was looking at social media this morning, many thinking that Fauci would be able to say whatever he wanted to say, uh, and, and maybe we could get a truer sense of what was happening with COVID-19. For the most part, it doesn't seem, and at least, you know, in terms of this whole hearing, we're still fairly early into it. Uh, you know, they do a lot of talking in these things. Um, but for the most part, Dr. Fauci has seemed fairly consistent mm -hmm. uh, what he's saying uh, in terms of what he's saying now compared to what he's been saying uh, consistently at those daily briefings. We haven't seen him at the briefings uh, recently. There's always that speculation, uh, you know, that, that he wasn't being allowed to speak freely. But for the most part, uh, Dr. Fauci has dealt primarily or dealt almost exclusively with the facts of the matter at the briefing room, uh, in the briefing room, as it seems that he's doing here now. All right, Trevor Shirley, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time here on Newsfeed Now. Moving on, a mysterious illness that affects children could be linked to the coronavirus. And it's rare, but the complications are serious and it's all alarming doctors. Here's Donovan Long. This is a rare but serious complication. Helen DeVos Children's Hospital doctors are calling this complication pediatric multisystem inflammatory illness. They say it's linked to a coronavirus infection in children and most importantly affects the heart. If a child does develop this inflammatory syndrome, they certainly do need medical attention. Pediatricians at DeVos Children's Hospital say three West Michigan kids, all under the age of 10, were diagnosed with the illness or Kawasaki disease, which closely mirrors the illness. Doctors are working to confirm if their conditions are linked to the coronavirus, although they suspect it is. We have to wait for some time for the body to produce antibodies against coronavirus to be able to detect that that was actually at play. Doctors on the east side of the state say they've seen around 25 cases of this illness at Children's Hospital of Michigan in Detroit. Most of these patients are going into the intensive care unit. We've had two patients go on ECMO, which is um, it's, it's like a heart-lung bypass machine. Before the illness gets that severe, medical professionals want parents to look out for symptoms of the illness. For younger children, they include a prolonged fever of at least 101 degrees, a rash, abnormal discoloration of skin, red eyes or tongue, puffy or cracked lips, and swelling in the hands or feet. In older children or teenagers, doctors say look for a two-day fever of at least 101 degrees, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Interesting stuff there coming out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. What was that, Matt? All right, we are trying to get Donovan Long on the phone here. Of course, the thought process early on when we were talking about coronavirus and children was the fact that maybe children are, were not going to be quite as uh, susceptible to some of the, the effects of the coronavirus as older people. But what's interesting to me about this story that Donovan was just talking about is the fact that maybe some of those symptoms, you know, can come over to uh, to this new Kawasaki disease or something like that. Donovan now joins us. Donovan, is that kind of the fear? Because early on with the coronavirus was the fact that children were not as susceptible to the coronavirus, to COVID-19, that maybe this other thing that is showing up can actually link kiddos to the COVID. And then we've got this really weird kind of circular motion going on with COVID-19. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think that some parents are a little appre still apprehensive about taking their children outside, but doctors want to make sure that they are telling parents that if any of their children are experiencing any of the symptoms identified in the piece, that they need to go to a hospital or seek medical, uh, medical um, uh, attention immediately because this disease proves deadly if, going, if it goes untreated. Michigan has been a hot spot, so let's shift from uh, kiddos there in Michigan to just numbers uh, in, as a whole. Are we seeing a flattening, maybe a declining uh, amount of numbers there in Michigan as those numbers early on were extremely high? Yeah, they were. The governor talked about that yesterday in her address to the state. You know, she's seeing improvement. She's saying that the social distancing measures she has in place are working, but that we need to continue um, adhering to those measures and those requirements because she's seeing a definitely a difference and a decline in the number of cases being reported, but we are not out of the woods just yet, as she uh, always says during her address. Donovan, thank you so much. Appreciate you taking the time. One reason to be cautious and fear COVID-19 is the acute illness some patients face. 
Here's an explanation with our medical expert, Dina Baer. This novel coronavirus frequently affects the nervous system. At least one third of the hospitalized COVID-19 patients have neurologic complication and two thirds of those who have severe disease and need to go to the ICU. SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is a coronavirus. Similar viruses are notorious for causing not just breathing problems, but neurological issues as well. This manifestation can go from headache, dizziness, difficulty concentrating, confusion, but may evolve into impairment of consciousness, strokes and seizures. Those are the symptoms in the acute phase of infection. There are several theories as to why COVID-19 affects the brain. Direct infection of the brain or the nerves by the virus, or it could be secondary to pneumonia, decreased oxygenation, and um, also multiple organ failure that would involve the brain. Or it can be an inflammatory or an immune response to the virus, an overreaction of the immune system against the virus that can also damage the brain and the nerves. And that means symptoms could last long after recovery from COVID-19. There are multiple studies documenting how similar viral infections led to psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. Dr. Igor Koralnik, Chief of Neuroinfectious Diseases and Global Neurology at Northwestern Medicine, says this virus is too new to know its potentially permanent effects. He's launched a study to determine exactly how SARS-CoV-2 may alter the brain long term. We are currently uh, starting to review the entire population of COVID-19 patients hospitalized at the Northwestern Medicine. All right, Dina Bear now joins us from Chicago. Dina, uh, isolation is causing headaches, but now you're finding out that COVID-19 may cause some neurological problems that are much further than what isolation headaches can be. This is fascinating stuff. Walk us through exactly what you found, and is it surprising for you? It was not only su surprising, but pretty scary. So 36% of COVID-19 patients have some sort of neurological manifestation. And because this disease is so intense, many people are on ventilators. Doctors can't really do the scans. They need to learn more information. For example, a spinal tap, a CT, or an MRI. There are studies going on all around the world as these neurological problems were discovered in COVID patients, first in China and in South Korea. The earlier studies on coronavirus Viruses. Think of SARS. They show a long-term effect on mental health, and that is incredibly frightening. At this point, doctors don't know if that's going to happen with COVID-19, but they also don't know if people who experience the neurological symptoms during their acute phase of illness would be most at risk. One thing is so critical. So many healthy people will say, this won't affect me, right? You've heard people say, my lungs are strong, my body's strong. But you have no idea whether this will get into your brain mm. and your vascular system. We've already talked on this show about the higher risk for stroke. Well, will that be long term? And that's why, as you mentioned, safety, practicing wise social distancing, masking, all of this that we don't want to do is so important. What's also important, according to our doctors, is team science. So we've talked about this, the idea of different fields coming together because this killer virus doesn't spare any part of the body. Dina, okay, so you mentioned testing. I, I'm curious, because this disease is so tough, doctors who need to do the testing while this is active in your body are not doing that. Is that normal with other diseases? And, and, and in this case, other, you know, trying to figure things out on something like this? It can be when there are comorbidities. You know, you have to sort of deal with the most acute thing first, and that's what's happening with SARS-CoV-2 and then the infection that you get, which is COVID-19. And so the doctors are testing the oxygen levels, for example. There are a lot of things that they are doing, but they're not able to truly look deeply into the neurological effects, and that's why they're saying a majority of the information that they're getting on this neurological effect is from post-mortem exams, mm. looking at the bodies of people who sadly wow. died from COVID-19. That is astounding stuff. Dina, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, really interesting there as you're looking at the possible head problems that come from COVID-19, like Dina just mentioned, neuro neurological problems. Fascinating stuff there.
From Chicago to Texas, a woman says her mail service stopped because she tested positive and wasn't able to get answers from her post office. Check this story out. I still have fever occasionally. Pamela Bilbo is recovering from COVID-19. Some depression over it because I haven't been able to touch or hug my family in over three weeks. She says what's made her feel even more isolated, not getting her mail. A little two inch by two inch post-it note from my carrier was in there that they were no longer going to deliver my mail service because someone has tested positive for COVID-19 at this resident. How did they know that someone had tested positive? I do not know the answer to that other than the Department of Health. Bilbo says she immediately called the Smithville Post Office, but they wouldn't tell her anything, so she emailed us. My sister, who lives with me, gets her stage four cancer treatment medications through the mail. A spokesperson with the U.S. Postal Service says the notice to the customer regarding their mail delivery was left in air. We apologize for any inconvenience that may have been experienced by our customer. This is from the carrier. Bilbo says she got a stack of mail over the weekend. A post-it note was on there from my carrier and she said, I stand with you. We wanted to know how many others could have gotten these post-its. A spokesperson says she's not a aware of any other instances, but Bilbo is skeptical, especially with more than 100 positive cases in Bastrop County. If it happened to me, it can happen to somebody else. Arzo Dost, KXAN Investigates. All right, Arzo now joins us live from Austin, Texas. Arzo, I think you said it best, or, or maybe uh, the woman you were interviewing, if it happens to her, it could happen to other people, not just in that county or city, but really any state across the south and and really across the nation did you find out anything else interesting that the post office is doing or is there a policy in place to where they're not going to give mail to someone who is going through or survive covid 19. well that's a great question and really until we had gotten pamela bilbo's tip we had you know gone reporting about all the measures that the u.s postal service was taking but after getting her email and realizing that the post office said that there was an error made we went back and forth all day yesterday asking about other counties asking about the more than 100 cases just in her county bastrop county um to see if we could learn anything more and as of this morning i checked back with the u.s postal service and we were told they have not come across any other instances um, but if there are it, they said look if there's anything like this happening this is a warning that this is not what we do we serve a vital role especially during this time because you know in Pamela Bilbo's case her sister was getting cancer medication through the mail so for her to have lost the service even for 24 to 48 hours was crucial so uh, again do we have any idea what the th thought process is from that first post-it that someone tested positive at that address and they could no longer deliver mail? Was the thought process that if they delivered mail, the mail could transfer COVID-19 from someone who opened the mailbox and therefore could get on the mail carrier? That's a good question, and we asked the U.S. Postal Service that question, and keep in mind from the video you watched, Pamela's Bilbo's mailbox was not anywhere close to her house. It was about 50 yards or so away from her home, um, and so she said, one, for them to have known that she had been diagnosed with with COVID-19 was very alarming because she didn't realize that her postal service wouldn't have that information. So that was alarming for her. But two, we asked the postal service and we've done other pieces regarding COVID-19 virus being on the mail. And as of this morning, they confirm again that there's been nothing that says that if there is mail, if you're getting mail and it's come in touch in contact with someone with the virus, that it's gonna transmit. All right, Arzo, before you go, I, I wanna reiterate this point. Uh, you have spoken to the US Postal Service and it is not the policy or it is the policy that they will not deliver to an address that has a COVID survivor or someone who is currently going through the coronavirus. 
they say they deliver to everybody right. and that this was a mistake. That just because you have been diagnosed with the virus does not stop your mail. It should not stop your mail. And if anybody else out there has any problems, you need to get in touch with the post office. One more quick question. Have they identified that mail carrier and would there be punishment in line for that mail carrier who had left that first post-it? You know, they have identified the mail carrier and it actually is going to be traced back to the post office because there's a lot of back and forth as far as who put the posted note in that mail package and who, you know, obviously the carrier put the mail in her mailbox, but the guidelines came to her from someone else. And so they're looking into all of this from what we're told. And as soon as we started calling and asking questions, her mail was restored within 24 mm. hours, um, and we were told that everyone at that post office was notified and told this should not be happening. You brought up another good point, and I think it's, uh, we'll end on this one, but the fact, you know, there are HIPAA laws in this country that protect medical information from getting out. Uh, any idea how in the world that post office, that carrier, knew about a medical condition from inside that home? Well, we asked, and Pamela Bilbo thinks that it was through the health department. Yeah. But what's interesting is that she said when she was there, it was the health department and the police office. And the post office claims the order came from the police department, which, of course, the police department says that's not the case. Yeah. But just yesterday, we learned that actually Texas health officials can provide addresses of COVID-19 uh, patients to law enforcement. So it was legal. So, so that's a legal process there in Texas. It is. That's baffling. Okay. All right. Interesting stuff. All right. Thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time, Arzo. Final story. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about an American hero who was battling the virus. He survived World War II, and now he's right in the middle of this pandemic. Here's Sheree Hennecutt. 99-year-old Max DeWeese doesn't consider himself a hero. He earned two Purple Hearts in World War II and won the battle against COVID-19. I'm a warrior, not a warrior. And... I try not to worry about things. A procession of family, friends, Marines, and nurses lined the street to celebrate. I don't know how the word got out to so many people. I really don't. It's a victory for Max. He added two medals to his collection, but says friendship is the true reward of what he's endured. But I have been so blessed with friendship and love from these people that uh, there's nothing can replace that nothing and hopefully it makes me a little better man than i was before i started paul chapa with friends and service of heroes has known max for years and stood by him through his fight he made one of the medals for max and is grateful to see he survived there's nothing that max can't do it, it certainly scared us when we heard that max had been admitted but it's no surprise that max has beat this his attitude and his never give, give up spirit is something that was ingrained in him as, as a young Marine and still lives with him today. He says he can't wait to get back to playing golf and spending time with his best friend. He says life now has a little more meaning. I've gone through four engagements in the Pacific, World War II, and that was hell. This wasn't near as bad because at my age I figured what's going to happen is going to happen and I'll ride with it. So, And I've ridden it, and thank goodness the good Lord has seen fit to keep me around for a little while longer. Sheree Honeycutt, Fox 4 News. Story. Sheree joins us now live from Kansas City. Sheree, I want to read this uh, quote one more time. I've gone through four engagements in the Pacific World War II, and that was hell. This wasn't near as bad because at my age, I figured out what's going to happen is going to happen. I can't even put in perspective for everyone that we've talked about the coronavirus, we've talked about the difficulties with susceptible age groups, and this guy's saying that World War II was hell, and this wasn't that bad. I know, it's crazy. I met Max um, years ago at a World War II memorial ceremony, and when I found out he had coronavirus, I was just so upset. Um, and then when I called him, I said, how are you doing? He said, yeah, I've been to worse. Only from continue to prove and the and he true to 
Very cool story. Before you go, I, I want you to talk about one other thing about this guy. I'm a warrior, not a worrier. Uh, I mean, this guy is just chock full with quotes that you could put on your Twitter page. Hint, hint. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm terrible at Twitter. Max is a true inspiration for me. I need to start tweeting more, and uh, I'm truly sorry for that. Uh, but Max is just, is just the best. I, I swear I'm going to adopt him as a grandma. Max definitely uh, has our thoughts, uh, our smiles today. Sheree, thanks for being a good sport. We appreciate it. Uh, love to hear that, and I hope all of you at home think the same thing, that don't be a warrior right now. Be a warrior. We are here providing facts for you. We're not going to give you any fear. We don't want you to worry about anything. We're going to give you exactly what you need to know. So be a warrior today, just like Max. Have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow.